Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I'm Angie, and I am an alcoholic. I want to thank Kathy, Craig, and the committee for inviting me. I'd like to thank my body for not giving me asthma this morning. And i also like to thank my head for not letting me sleep last night. So other than that, I'm fine. <laughs> and I heard Clancy last night, and um, I, was, I thought that the first time I ever knew there was a Clancy was when when he was eight years sober. And he was always throwing zingers there to people and pissing people off just like he is now. <laughs> and, and I, as you know, I just thought, why would a person, because he's all over the place, like fertilizer all over the place, and I'm thinking, why, why would a person such as Clancy or even myself, still get up here and listen to the same old dead story you got to say over and over and over again. And you know what it came to me? Is that the gratitude inspires a passion. It wakes up a passion and a love for this program. And the opportunity to get up to the podium and vomit out our pain. That's what it amounts to. That's what's happened to me. So over and over and over again until it gets filled up with the spirit and the love of Alcoholics Anonymous. I am really, really very grateful today to be able to stand up here for those of you that heard me say the last time I was over here that I wasn't going to speak anymore. I lied, okay? <laughs> my, uh, my badge says I'm from Banning. Uh, but I also lived in Blythe, and uh, a little over two years ago, I almost croaked with asthma, and my husband didn't want to move away from Blythe because he'd lived there 56 years, and I think he waited around for a while, see how I was going to croak so he wouldn't have to move out of there, and so when he found out I wasn't going to croak, he took me out to the beach. It's a little too far from Blythe, so he moved me over to Beaumont, so he could drive to Blythe. So I think he still lives in Blythe, and I live in Bowman, and we kind of visit each other from time to time. And I think that's where we are. I used to say that I lived in Blythe, and if it croaks tomorrow, I'm out of there tomorrow night. Well, I used to know I almost croak, and he took me out of there. Now he says, if I croak tomorrow, he's out of Bowman tomorrow and I'm back into Blythe. So, you know, what goes around comes around. So what I went to, to Blythe is because of Richard. He says, he's such a great guy. He carries my purse. He puts on my shoes and uh, ties my shoelaces because I can't reach him because things get in the way. And... Uh, um, <laughs> He keeps telling me I'm the right heavy, so I just keep eating. And uh, we're both dedicated to making me happy. I have him, I have him convinced he never had it so good. And that a woman's place is in the mall. Be- because time marches on, a woman's place is in eBay and QVC online. And then. I think uh, the U- I, we keep the UPS men in business, uh, and every day is Christmas at our house. And the next day, everything goes back. <laughs> and Richard gets to take care of both of those. And so I'm really, really, very, very blessed to have him in my life. But, you know, above everything else, I am so grateful that I'm an alcoholic and that I belong in Alcoholics Anonymous, to finally get to the place where I belong here. I've been here a long, long time, and I've never lost the passion. Newcomer, I've never lost the passion or the pink cloud that they talk about in Alcoholics Anonymous. Sometimes things get real, real, and then they get realer, 
And then you wonder what, what you did wrong. But you see, I learned from every experience that I ever had. As you can see by looking at me, I woke up this morning and I said, Richard, you know, I look like two red slits in a brown paper bag. And he just cracked up over there. But you know, I was born a long time ago. A long, long time ago. In a planet far, far away. <laughs> into a family that never got over being stunned that I belonged to them. <laughs> When they came home with me from the hospital, I didn't have a name. And the reason for that is because my daddy wanted to name me after his girlfriend, and my mother was narrow-minded. She was of the little... My name should have been Lupi, and you know what? Uh, Not too long ago, I ran into a, a man that had known me since I was two years old. I mean, that's really a long time ago. And he said I used to go topless. And, uh, you know, some, sometimes that happened later on, but now I, I don't even wear skirts. So uh, time marches on. They were, they were divorced when I was seven, and my mother would say things to me like, you're just like your father. And I knew what her opinion was of him. She didn't like him too well. So she would send me to the nuns so they could teach me to be a lady. And what the nuns thought was a lady wasn't appealing to me then, and it wasn't appealing to me now. <laughs> as soon as they said, thou shalt not, I may not, may not have thought of doing it before, but as soon as they said, thou shalt not, I had an overwhelming desire to do it. And so... I raised the nun skirt, see what she wore under all them clothes, and the 86 me from catechism. And when I got home, I got a whip, and I was always whipped. I was, I thought I didn't, that I was always, I didn't know I was a better child. If I thought I was a better child, I'd have held it against them guys. If it was today, I'd have called the cops, you know. Never mind that I was running away from home when I was three. So, you know, uh, uh, stealing everything that wasn't mine, you know, things of other people were always much more interesting than mine. But when I, when I got to school the next day, all the kids thought I was terrific. I got all this attention, and I was so surprised that they thought that I was important. Because, you see, me, I was born with an emptiness in my soul. There was always a yearning, a longing, a hunger to be loved, to be wanted, to be accepted. I was always so hungry for love that I'd have given my heart to anybody that would take it. So when I got all that attention, it filled up some of them empty places. And I like to think that uh, I always had the pilot lid. All I ever needed was a fuel. Time went on, and my mother took up with a, up with a man that was starting to get funny with me, and I said, well, look here, what this man's trying to do. And she said, you're a liar, and you've always been a liar, and you can't stand for anybody to be happy. And you know, uh, I believe that. I believe, I felt so alone and so kicked to the curb, I think is what they say today. And that's how it always was with me. And I used to think, if I could only get to my daddy. Now, my daddy was over in the San Fernando Valley where he'd taken up light housekeeping with a lady with eight kids. And he used to take people up north to pick grapes and prunes. And we were fruit pickers. And God, just in case you didn't know, I'm a Mexican. And God made two kinds of Mexicans as fruit pickers and non-fruit pickers. And I'm not a fruit picker. They try to make a fruit picker out of me. In fact, I've really gotten a, a really close to a lot of things, but I've never been, never been in any danger of being addicted to work. And, uh, and, and Richard knows this, so he says if he ever feels like he's going to croak, he's going to run to the freeway and eat a Peterbilt so I can, uh, or a Mac truck so I can get double indemnity on his insurance. Isn't it great? I just love him so much. <laughs> So, but I'll tell you, we stayed beyond the season with the Gallo brothers. And they gave my dad a case of wine, and somebody must have said, Thou shalt not. I felt, I heard Clancy last night, I felt so sorry for him. Because I'll tell you what, when I had that wine that went inside of me, I felt like, boom! 
I mean, I felt like I put my fingers in the light socket. Everything felt wonderful. I just, I found magic. I found something excited. I got hooked on that feeling forever. I love that feeling that I got when I took that first drink. And because I'm not a sipper, I'm a chuggalugger. I just drink more tea. I want I know the first one is good, the second one's going to be better. And I chuggle like that down, and before you know it, it's the next day. <laughs> I don't know what happened, but I know something terrible happened. I'll tell you what, I was from the Pachuco days, when we used to wear them big hairdos, yakum dudes the next day, and all that hair is done stuck in your face. <laughs> You feel so dry. Oh, everything hurts. You get under the water and you get drunk all over again with that water. Oh, it was terrible. My clothes is tore, torn. I didn't know what had happened. I knew it was something terrible. I could, I could see it in their eyes. You know, they get their eyes that I told you so, that contempt, that disgust. And I put an attitude. I don't care attitude. But you see, I always cared. I felt like so shame, so much shame. And I felt dirty. And that's the way I always felt after I drank. But you see, I never forgot how it felt the first time I took that drink. And it wasn't long after that that I came back to Orange County to my mother's. And she told me I couldn't come home. And I was just a child. I was 13 years old. And I never felt like I was 13 years old. I always felt like I was old and used up. And now I used up meat that nobody wanted. That's how I felt. And it was a, a long time ago I was living here and there and everywhere. I don't know how to work. I babysit and I burglarize houses. That's what I did. I really wasn't a bad person, but your things were much more interesting than, my, than mine. And besides, I thought you should share. And this is a time when I discovered the booze and the boys and the cha-cha-cha. God, I, I love the booze and the boys and the cha-cha-cha in that order. And we Mexicans, we like to have them parties for the whole weekend. We get drunk and shoot each other up and <laughs> knife each other. We, we ain't had any knifings and shootings and the cops and the ambulances don't come. We ain't had no fun. Everybody say, look at them. They're, they're killing each other. They don't know. We're just having fun. We don't. And I was also one of the original topless bottomless dancers in them parties because in those days they used to say, take it off, take it off, and I thought they meant it. <laughs> and so I did. I was very popular with the boys, but the girls, you know, they always would try to tell me the next day what I had done, so I used to beat them up and then they didn't tell me. <laughs> Violence is the way I handled anything that uh, that was embarrassing or that shamed me. And so the day came when the state of California discovered me. They didn't understand that my case was different, and they took me for before a judge, and there sat my mother and my aunts and all the mother purple lip little people, purple lip because they're Mexicans, they don't have blue lips. And with that, that look, you know that look, we told you so, huh? And the judge asked me, well, young lady, what do you think we had to do with you? Well, I put my collar up and scrunched down on my seat. They say, you're the judge, man. You ought to know. There was a wrong time to have that kind of an attitude. <laughs> Send me and my attitude to do a little bit of time for the state of California. When I got out, I took my first inventory. I didn't have a job, I didn't have any money, I didn't have an education, I didn't have a home, and I'm thinking, what in order I can go through with it? I better go out and find me a husband. And I went out looking for a husband in places that husbands are not to be looked for. And unfortunately for, for both of us, I found one. There's a certain kind of man always caught my attention. Usually they got muscles and walk with a little slouch and tight t-shirts and tattoos. Now everybody and his sisters got tattoos, but in those days only the bad boys got mother born to lose. They walk with a little slouch. I mean, they almost dance when they walk, don't they? <laughs> and they say, what's happening, baby? God, they used to, that still gives me chills. <laughs> I, I used to think that was charisma. Today I know it to be psychosis. <laughs> we went on a dance of death. 
My sponsor used to tell me, Angie, you can't make chicken salad out of chicken shit. But we tried. We tried, I tell you. I've been apologizing to my kids ever since for the set of jeans we put together. You know, I take full responsibility for whatever happened to them. But it was exciting. Three months later, we were pregnant and I was married. And he decides I should stay home because he don't like people talking their way about his wife. But he ain't staying home with me. So I stay home, but I don't stay home silently. When he gets home, I'm waiting for him. And I tell him who his mother copulated with when he was conceived and who his grandmother copulated when his mother was conceived. You know, and he's a good Mexican husband. He says, if you don't shut up, I'm going to knock you out. He says, sure smacks of thou shalt not to me. So I jump him every time for a scratch his face. See, he explained that to his partner. I'll tell you, we had a great marriage. <laughs> Why? Why the, I heard once about it. It's like the, what the, the cat that jumped on the skunk didn't get all he wanted, just all he could stand on. <laughs> it's kind of like that. By the time I had my baby, I realized this man didn't want to be married. And that he didn't want to be married to me. Because there was something terribly wrong with me that I didn't know what it was that everybody could see but me. And when they put that baby in my arms, I felt like finally somebody belongs to me. That baby inspired feelings within me that nobody ever has and very few people since. I would sit by the hour and look at my baby. I love my baby. I promised her I would never beat her, abandon her, and discard her as I had been. And I meant it with every fiber of my being. But I'm an alcoholic, and I am a woman alcoholic. And when I drink, I have absolutely no choices and no rights. When I drink, I'm going to do what's in front of me to do, what's it's there to do. I don't know about tomorrow. I don't know about prizes. I just know I just got to go. I just got to go, and I just got to go. This man did, didn't want me to drink, so he introduces me with little white pills with crosses on them. I don't know what they are, but I sure knew what they do to me. But, you know, I have one eyeball over there and one over there, and I make baby clothes all night long. I just come <laughs> all by myself. And it started out as exciting, and it started out in the fountain of youth. And one day at a time, it took me into literal hell. I think that there's some of us, when he talks about chapter 3, but the things that we could increase the list at infinitum to control and enjoy our drinking, and some of us have to turn to other chemicals. I was running away from them blackouts and them puking drugs. I had another baby, and then I left this man because it wasn't getting any better. I've looked at my life since then, and you know, I was 22 years old, and I felt so empty and so used up. And the body was still young, but the inside was dead. And I look at my life today at 73. And, you know, I feel today the way a woman should feel at, at 22 instead of 73. Because I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. But I had a lot of road to go. Uh, this is a time when I spend five years as an unprotected bar drinking woman. I know the feeling of degradation and self-loathing that the alcoholic woman has when she's unprotected and she drinks in bars, when many a times I had to come home to that cold water shack where two little girls lived, that the romance of being a mother had long since died, and their responsibility for them choked me. You see, they had nobody else but me to take care of them, and I resented. I couldn't, I was a child needed taken care of, and I had to go out and do whatever I had to do to support them little girls. And they had the big eyes. They were terrified because I didn't, they didn't know whether I would wake up and start screaming and yelling and hitting or hugging them and crying, you see. And I didn't know either. And there was many times when I would start hitting and once I started hitting, I couldn't stop and I wouldn't stop until there was blood and then there was tears. And when there was one time a little voice kneeled in front of me and said, Mommy, Mommy, please don't hit me anymore. And I had that little voice many years later say, Mommy, Mommy, please, please come and get me from jail. I can't stand it here one more day. 
And the first time I couldn't because of my disease. And the second time I couldn't because of her disease. And those are the heartaches. You know, I know the book talks about we will not regret the past nor wish to shut the door on it. And I do not regret my past. But whoever wrote that could not have had the heart and the soul of a mother. The regret. I regret the things that I did to two little girls, two innocent little girls. And yet it is because of those regrets and those heartaches about my little two, my little girls that I have learned to have a tender heart and, and an understanding today of the pain that a mother goes through. And I'm sure that fathers too, but because I'm a woman, I understand the women for the pain and the guilt and the regrets of the type of mother that has to be an abuser because there's no other way but violence many times. After five years, I started getting letters from this Dauphine husband that was someplace in Texas getting the cure and says, babes, this time it's going to be different. And so it was. He came uh, out and we he knifed me and because I wouldn't stop drinking and I called the cops on him and four days later he apologized, called and apologized to me and so we came to Las Vegas to get married. I've been married in Las Vegas three times and I really, I, I'm a multi-marrier. I've been married five times to three husbands. <laughs> Richard is my current husband. But uh, who knows? <laughs> Some good-looking guys out there. I look at them today. I may be old, but I ain't dead. <laughs> Something happened. Something happened. I married him in the Catholic Church, and that's going to any length for a Catholic, especially since he was a Methodist. I was going to make this marriage work no matter what. But you know, I'm a firm believer you can place me in the best of circumstances. But sooner or later, I have to create what is inside of me. And it wasn't long before that madness was so, so incredible that I started making to the run to the wineries. We moved into a place called Mira Loma. Life has been called the armpit of California. But my experience in Mira Loma was another part of the anatomy not worth mentioning. But you see, I, it was there that every hope and every dream came, went out of my life, where uh, I tried so hard uh, to, to do it, and I couldn't do it. He, when he started making the runs the, back to Orange County to his connection, I started making the runs to the wineries, and something happened to my drinking. I pushed away through my violence everybody that was near and dear to me. And all I did was go in my dirty bedroom and drink and drink and drink. Till I got to the place where I drank and my body is drunk and my mind's in agony. I would come to in my own filth, and I'm talking every filth that a human being can have. I was 31 years old woman, so dead. Everything was dead except my body. I just wanted to die. And I waited until this man was home one day and I told him I was going to kill myself. And he said, okay. And went back to watching television. We had a slight communication problem. And uh, when I, uh, I took, I guess, enough pills to kill a horse, and all I did was sleep for two days and two nights. And when I came to, I wasn't glad to be alive. I came to, and it has got to be the loneliest day of my life, when I couldn't drink and I couldn't be sober and I couldn't live and I couldn't die. And there was a madness inside of me, knowing this man had... Had had uh, this man had been in bed with me both nights, and never once did he consider taking me to a doctor or to a hospital. And I died inside because I couldn't die on the outside. But I know today that my higher power has always had His hand upon my life, even upon that day, because you see there was a knock on the doors, a lady from the PTA. If there's somebody I didn't want to see, is a lady by the PTA, and there stood Mrs. Clean, and she said, hi. And, and she must have taken a whiff of me, because she said, what is wrong? And I proceeded to tell her what was wrong, and about this SOB, and how, I just told her everything about him. 
In that moment of weakness, and uh, something happens to me when I start talking, people get a glazed look in their eyes. And, uh, but uh, that's okay, I'm familiar with that. But when, when they get an interested look in their eyes, I say, uh oh. And she asked me if I ever heard of Al Anon, and I'd never heard of Al Anon. And she uh, stayed with me and cleaned me up and took me to Al Anon. And somehow I didn't fit in in Al Anon. I, I felt a, a little bit like a whore would in a nunnery. There was absolutely no identification between me and them square broads. But you know, they put their arm around me and I smiled at them. I gave, somebody along the line, somebody had said I had a beautiful smile, so I gave him one of those. The lights are on, but there's nobody home smile. And I thought I fooled them. I found out later on they would laugh at me. I thought they, that they, that I had them fooled. And I, she, I would go every so often to Al Anon. I, I, I just would go to Al Anon, then go back into the trash can, to the garbage can. And one day I didn't hear nothing. I heard the word release. So I went home and told him in detail how I was going to release him. So he used to sleep in a corner with a knife under the pillow, and I'd sit in the other corner and watch him. When he go a doze enough, i go take a little peek at him, and he'd go, oh. I love that. I was almost sexual. I felt so good to him. Then he would say unkind things to me. He'd say, baby, I may have a monkey on my back, but you got an orangutan. And one day I came home and he was gone. He took everything with him. That's the way it had to be. Because you see, I had the feeling inside of me. Do anything you want to me, just don't leave me. And I'd have stayed there till he'd have killed me. Or I'd have killed him, you see, because that's, I didn't know there was another way to go. And because bad luck comes in bunches, they got together, the melanons, and they threw me a, they des- threw me over to their husbands who they didn't like either. And they designated that poor soul that had inflicted me upon them to take me over there. And they- she took me to an old dilapidated old house in Pomona. She took me through the back because I'm a Mexican. And then, then she took me through the kitchen and I found out it's because all the Alanons were standing in the kitchen doing whatever Alanons do in the kitchen. And I walked through them people. I didn't look at their faces. I knew the look of contempt and disgust that the clean people always had for me. See, I walked through them people, looked through my feet. I walked into a room. The first thing that I heard was the music of Alcoholics Anonymous. There's music and there are words here. And I didn't hear the words, but I heard their music. They were laughing. They were talking. They were loving each other, just like we do at every meeting. You see, but I had never heard that. They were laughing. Do you know how long it had been since I had left? And I loved how I felt when I was with you from the first moment I came to you. And I looked around and I said, it's too bad I'm not an alcoholic. If there's another name for the disease that you and I have, it's called I ain't got it. Now, I know I'm weird and I know I'm different and three steps ahead of the man with a butterfly nut. But I know I'm not an alcoholic. I used to be an alcoholic, but I cured with the benzatrine. I just not, I just don't know how to do the balance anymore. You know, you only can get it all. You have to be very busy and a great chemist if you're out there to balance it out, everything out. <laughs> so I said, I looked around at all them sober, single, good looking young guys, and I said, I'm gonna get me one of those. And I did. My higher power knew what caught my attention. And so I came around Alcoholics Anonymous for 10 months as a visitor. And people would never say, you don't belong here. Somehow you understood I've been kicked in the teeth by life and rejected by everybody I come in contact with. And I couldn't have stood any more rejection. You put your arm around me and you said the most important words that you and I have to say to one another. I said, keep coming back. Keep coming back. What a disappointment it was to me when I found out you were telling that to everybody. I thought it was just... Other than that, I'm not self-centered. I stopped drinking because I felt like such a fraud and doubled up on the poison, other poison I was taking and this guy wants to get rid of me. I'm not easy to get rid of. 
because I didn't have a backup. And so um, I started, I think today they call it stalking. I was just interested in everything he was doing and with whom. And, uh, you know, they don't, uh, try to kill him, and they don't like for you to try to kill him when they're sober. <laughs> so one day I walked into a room, and this cute little boy with big blue eyes and blonde hair, he says he don't have a girlfriend, he don't have a surfboard, and he don't have a car. And I think to myself, give me a little boy, I'll take care of you. <laughs> and he don't know what hit him. <laughs> But after that relationship was over, he decided to become a minister. And I'd like to think that somehow, in my small way, I helped push him over to God. I don't like women. I don't trust men. And I, I don't leave you much. And I didn't know that you go through stuff called withdrawal here, where you walk around without skin. That's, what, that's all I can attribute it. Every nerve. I couldn't predict in half an hour whether I would want to kill you or me, or love you, or me. You know, I just could not. It was, that's the way I was crazy. I think today they call it bipolar, or <laughs> tripolar, or whatever polar. I'll tell you, every alcoholic's got that. Especially if you're new. I know I had it. You th- they didn't have anything at that time. You just walk around without skin, and they say these two shall pass. You know, and... That's all they said. This too shall pass. You knew it was going to pass for them, but my case is different. I'm so glad that God brought that gentle young man into my life at a time when I was so vulnerable. He was the first man that had ever been kind to me. He was the first man that had ever been gentle with me. And everywhere that he wanted to take me, he wanted to take me with him. But you see, I did. I didn't have a God. I didn't trust God. I believed in God. And when he got drunk, so did I. It was not my worst drunk, but it seemed to be it was my most hopeless one. And I came back to Alcoholics Anonymous because a man named Carson went and brought me back on a rainy Wednesday night in December. And the miracle for me is not that I've come back to Alcoholics Anonymous, but that I'm still here. And that last December the 22nd, I celebrated my 40th year as a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And, and as Clancy said so eloquently last night, I am not a miracle. The miracle is this big book of Alcoholics Anonymous that has not had to change in over 70 years to save the lives of people like you and me. I heard a speaker say once, it's a long way from here to Akron, Ohio. It's a long way. But you see, there is a power in here that grabbed me. I loved how I felt when I was with you, and I came back because I had no place else to go. I don't believe that you have to be desperate to stay sober. It just helps. It just helps to open up the, the yeah, but. You know, I have a, a brain that says, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but. I heard one day that yeah, but was the mating call of the closed-minded asshole. And, you know, uh, I hope that my... My language does not offend you. It offends me, but it happens anyway. I think I love how defiant I still am and profane I still am. I sponsor a woman that's got eight and a half months, and she said, you're going to speak on Sunday morning? Isn't that a spiritual meeting? (laughs) No respect. And my journey began. I married that young man. I didn't have a sponsor. God was my sponsor. And then one day I told Clancy I didn't have a sponsor, and he was ugly to me, just like he's ugly with a lot of other people. So I went and got a sponsor. She used to talk to me and sponsor. I don't know what she's talking about. I just, I treated her like I treated the priest. You just tell them what they want to hear. And uh, I believe that the first five years I just gathered information. I went to a lot of meetings, and, and I got involved, and I still didn't like a lot of you, uh, mostly mostly the women. I'm glad they didn't have a lot, a lot of young women at that time, because I was with that young guy, and I was like a monkey with his monklet, <laughs> protecting him from them young girls. <laughs> we got married, and it was, it was interesting. He was 11 years younger than I, and uh, he uh, kind of paid for everything I ever experienced with the first one. We also got married once here, 
think it was a drive-in chapel. And uh, we said we were, uh, we were doing okay. I was doing okay. I didn't like him too well, and because he's like doo-wop, doo-wop music. And hell, I lived there in the fifties, and he was. So anyway, I had a sponsor that told me he was gonna. I better give this young guy up, and I couldn't live without a man. So I would just stay with him until the day came when my higher power had it said it's time. I was five years sober, and he decided he didn't want to be married. And I felt abandoned. It, uh, my children had started drinking and taking drugs, and I used to pray God spare my babies, and he didn't spare my babies. He left me when and tried to kill myself, when and took me to the psycho ward, left me, and, uh, and um, I had the, uh, the women in Alcoholics Anonymous that came around me. And finally, I just didn't care what you knew about me. I didn't care. There's nothing like having no place else to go, nothing to lose. There was a song that said, freedom is not having nothing else to lose. I had nothing else to lose. So I so finally was able to share the secrets of my heart with you. And you were able to share the secrets of my heart, your heart with me. And I found out that I was not any different than the toast burners. Maybe I had it easy because I never had to suck it up for anybody. Yeah, like some of you had to, you see. And it is... um the men that treated me like a lady that I learned to be a lady. But it's because I finally made peace with my God. I finally said, God, I'm never going to be happy again. All you ever want me to do is work with the sick women drunks and let them puke on me. All right. So I moved to Orange County, and I got a sponsor. I finally got a, sp- a woman that was louder than my head. If I can't have a sponsor that's louder than my head, forget it. And uh, she, her name was Mary Reagan, and she was my sponsor for 23 years, and Clancy was her sponsor. And she loved Clancy, and I loved Mary Reagan. And she taught me how to get the, the message out of the big book and apply it into my life. She got to tell me things that I never heard before. She used to say things to me like, Angie, you don't have to sit in your own shit just because it's warm. <laughs> When I would come to her with problems before I even got it out of my head, she would say, who's not doing it your way? And uh, she'd say, you just go make amends to them people. And, you know, and she'd say, keep your mouth shut. I want you to see, I want to see blood in your mouth the, the next time from biting your tongue. So she'd talk me, to me very carefully. <laughs> and I listened to her good. And the reason that I got this woman for my sponsor is because, you see, when I got to the other side, the other side of having been abandoned, again, I touched a power and a strength that was way down inside of me. And I realized that nothing and nobody could ever own me again. After all that's said and done, it's only you and me, God, anyway. That which I expected from them people, they never had it to give. The expectations that I have is from my moral value judgment, and which is so damaged. And so uh, that didn't work. And so I tried what worked for me, which was the way Mary Reagan taught me. Uh, my children came back. I don't even want them back. They came back one at a time. They went to uh, to work. They supported me while I went to school and learned to become self-supporting through my own contributions. And I started. I lived nine years by myself and learned to live by myself and know that there's a difference between uh, being having lo- being lonely and having solitude. Sometimes I know the loneliness inside of not having somebody that loved me. Somebody that cared just for me would be so overwhelming. And I would say to God, God, if you want me to be this lonely, I will do it. I just need your power here. I just need your power because I can't stand it. You know, little by little, that loneliness left. And when I started working with them women and threw myself into this program without any reservation and started working with these women, I used to go to 12-step houses and take the women to my house or to the meeting. They thought I cared. I didn't care. I just did it because I'm supposed to do it. You know, God has a sense of humor when I act as if one day I care. One day I started caring. I don't know where that comes from. I've never gotten rid of a defect of character that I wanted to get rid of. It was really uh, quite a thing for me 
quite a revelation when I read in the book. It's when I asked God to remove from me every single character defect that stands in the way of my usefulness to you and to my fellows. I didn't want him to take the ones that he wanted. I wanted to take the ones that make me look bad. But he, uh, he let me keep some of those. I said, well, God, now that I'm so spiritual, what about my weight? He says, the only thing keeps you humble. And I said, I think I'm sober long enough so that I can handle money. He says, well, let's try you out with credit cards. And he says, you flunked. So, that's the way my God talks to me. I had an opportunity again to find out what was, go- what was inside of me. When I was, uh, I don't know how long I was sober, my sister, who had always been held up as an example for me, chose to take her life, and it was my destiny to be the one to find her. And I could not believe what was before my eyes. Death had never touched me that close. And uh, I, I just almost freaked out. And something came together that said, God is the only giver and take her life. She chose to go, and he let her go home. I am still here because I am God's melody of life, and he sings his song through me. Someplace, somewhere, somebody out there needs to know the places I come from. Because his hand is always light whenever it is heavy. Two weeks later, I became a grandma. And I love being a grandma. You know, I finally learned how to get along with kids. Just give them everything they want. It was uh, during this time I was working in a treatment center and I was uh, uh, working as a counselor there and there was this cowboy came in, not this cowboy, here, that cowboy over there. And it was very crass and unethical, but I fell in love with one of the inmates. And I, of course, I didn't make no moves on him and when he went back and he used to call me and I talk AA to him, and then I had to have some surgery, and he sent me flowers and called me every day. I'm just a sucker for all that, and uh, I guess I, I 13 stepped him. And um, I went to a conference once where I was speaking, and he went with me, and because I, I didn't think anybody would know me there. And um, here comes my friend Frank Sloan, and I said, Oh shit. And uh, Richard is with me, and I'm trying to hide him. Well, he's not easy to hide, you know. And Frank looks at me and looks at him and says, is he with you? And I say, oh, yeah. And he looks at him and he says, is he one of us? Well, he sees his nose is red and his hair and head is going like little dogs in the Mexican windows. He says, how long has that guy been sober? I said, oh, for five minutes. That's for God's sakes, Angie, give that good poor guy a break. Let him stay sober first. And I hurt my feelings. I went to my sponsor and I said, Mary, because <laughs> I also like to whine a lot. And uh, she said, Angie, he's a nice guy. If you don't want him, I'll take him. <laughs> she said, just tell him you scooped him in before somebody else does. If you're afraid somebody else is going to tell, somebody's going to find out something about you, just tell them, and then you won't be afraid. You see, it's a fear of you knowing who I am that brings the barriers. You know, I know that the highest we get here is sober, and the best we can be is human, and that humans do it right all the time except when we don't. You know, God wanted the perfect heat have made robots. You know, but we're all so colorful. And it doesn't matter. I got over uh, tried to get well. You know, it's amazing how I thought you're so, live long enough to be sober year, 40 years, you should be well. You don't, you still get the stuff I hear. You know, my granddaughter, the one that I adored, and now she's got, I got a great grandson. She called me up and said something to me, and I said, you know what I said to her? I said, F you, and hung up. I said, I can't believe that came out of my mouth. Me, the spiritual giant. <laughs> I sponsor some women that are here, and they're going to hold it against me. You know that they are, huh? You know, I just love sponsoring today. I know that uh, I can't speak so much anymore because I don't have the wind that I used to have. But yeah, because 
It takes other directions. The love and the passion takes other directions. You know, I love sponsoring that new one. She's got eight and a half months. Her name is Shelly, and she spent nine years going in and out. And I'm louder than her head. And I told her, you just do everything I do. You don't have to believe in God. I'll be your God. You just do everything I tell you right now. And you know, she's sober eight and a half years. I believe that I should be their first higher power, and then it's my job to switch them over to their higher power. I don't want nobody hanging on me like a possum with 20, 30 tits. So that... <laughs> you know, my children, because the fruit doesn't fall very far from the tree, my children are both alcoholics and uh, they're both sober and uh, <laughs> my oldest one that I had held in my arms so many years ago had 25, has 25 years of sobriety isn't it great last week she came over and said that she's going to live in her car because she lost her rent money at the casinos and not only that is and that was about half of it she lost a job, a house, a man, everything for the casinos. Sober. And going the, being the great mother with a great program, I gave her $1,500 for her rent. Yeah, I think it's called codependent, isn't it? <laughs> you see, it's easy for me to say, don't do this. But I don't want my daughter to go blow her brains out this time. This time I have to give her that chance because she never got that honest with Richard and I before. My other daughter, Norma, is 17 years. And you know my daughter, Norma? She loves this program. And she stands up in this program just the way I do. Richard says she's my legacy to Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, uh, she speaks also. And she was the one that said, kneel before me so many years ago and said, Mommy, Mommy, please don't beat me anymore. I let my children tell me they're poison. I let them vomit their poison at me. And I said, you're right, I did it to you. Whether it was through genes or through environment, it was my fault. But the recovery has to be yours. I can't keep paying for my past anymore. You have to learn how to forgive me because I'm not going to go through this anymore. I am made my amends to you, and I can't do any more. If I could cut my arms off and give them to you, I would. I could cut my heart off and give it to you, I would. But I can't. Your recovery is yours. So I'm grateful that they're members of Alcoholics Anonymous, but they have their path, just like I have my path. I took that granddaughter that I said F you to her, to her one time to a convention with me when she's still little and in love with her granny. And uh, um, I had a big white blouse with the covers a multitude of tortillas and bullet beans and white pants. That, uh, and she looked up at me and she said, Grandma, you look just like the white angel. And I looked at this child that never saw me drink again. She never saw me crawling around in my own filth. Uh, so, so bloated and sometimes so beaten up. And my daughter, she never had to hear what her, her mother had to hear and her sister, flesh hidden against flesh and screams of pain and screams of anger. She's never had to see me battering her like I battered her mother and her grandmother. You see, all she's seen is what you've done with me. And I could, there was a dirty bedroom that I lived in, Mira Loma where I couldn't get out of bed, and I couldn't drink, and I couldn't be sober. And I would couldn't, and I lay there in agony, and cry out in agony. And there's no road that leads from there to here. I could never have unraveled it to tell you that today, Richard and I still love each other, and still he tells me that he loves me. And not every day, and I tell him too. If he dies tomorrow, if I die tomorrow, None of the people at my house have to regret anything that they have that have experienced with me because we've all said the forgiveness and the I love you. And I'm sure the last chapter isn't written with my granddaughter. She's still young and stupid, and I know by being young and stupid, 
I know about being old and stupid, but uh, uh, you know, it's just uh, I've had an opportunity this year to to uh, reunite with a friend that I had was in her wedding 57 years ago, and with a boyfriend that I had 57 years ago. I haven't seen him. I don't. I want him to remember me when I was 16, not when I'm 73. Cause you know, vanity just dies hard. Uh, I want to thank you so much for inviting me. You may not see me again. On the other hand, you just might. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.